tonight's panel, Comics Underground and Above. My name is Sean Quimby. I'm the director of Columbia University's Their Book and Manuscript Library. I'd like to thank each of you for joining us on this uh, most spring-like of evenings. And uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for helping us to reflect on the history and legacy of Kitchen Sink Press. At the conclusion of the panel dis discussion, we'll move into the adjoining space here uh, for a celebratory reception and continued conversation. If you possess the interest and the stamina, uh, please join us on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday evenings this week <laughs> for uh, other RBML sponsored lectures on Thomas Merton, Christopher Columbus, and 16th century German manuscripts. We have something for everyone. <laughs> Uh, details can be found on our library homepage at library.columbia.edu. Since arriving on campus in September, I've spent a good deal of time trying to understand the scope and content of RBML's collections. When I've asked people, and some of them long, long time friends of the library, what our most distinctive collections are, I almost never received the same response. It's rather like the story of blind, the blind men trying to describe an elephant. A tusk here, a big floppy ear there, and so on. Fortunately, I have a team of very talented curators to guide me, and each one of those is fiercely dedicated to his or her elements. And none of them is fiercer in their dedication than their dream. Karen is Columbia's ancient and medieval history and religion librarian, as well as the adjunct curator of comics with RBML. She holds graduate degrees from Columbia and Rutgers universities, and as we already know, she needs no further introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give you Karen Green. Very, very excited that Sean came here to be the director of our Rare Book and Manuscript Library because he's a big comics fan and came to Syracuse, which had big comics archives. So he and I are going to make some serious trouble together. Um, uh, I, I guess I can't say much more about introducing myself than, than Sean did. Uh, I'll just say that we started our graphic novels collection in the Circulating Library all, nearly 10 years ago, which is still kind of amazing to me. And, uh, we started with three volumes, and we now have over 5,000 titles in about a dozen languages. So I'm feeling pretty cocky indeed. <laughs> <laughs> it's been almost four years since we started collecting archives, uh, starting with Chris Claremont's archives in 2011. Uh, there's, a, there's a few little brochures on the table on the side about Comics at Columbia that talk a little bit about our archival program. So if any of you are <coughs> worried about where your archives are going to go, uh, you are welcome to uh, investigate there. I'm actually going to take a moment to plug something else. This is going to be on that um, table as well. There's an amazing conference that's going to be at CUNY next month called Queers and Comics. And Howard will be there, and for reasons beyond my understanding, I will be introducing him, which is very exciting to me, and probably far less so to him. Uh, but uh, an astonishing lineup of, of queer cartoonists and people who like queer cartoonists, which are the best people. So I am going to introduce our moderator, Jim, who is lurking in the middle in a way that I would not necessarily have uh, expected. I thought he'd be on the end. So I'm very excited that Jim is here because Jim collaborated with Dennis Kitchen on an exhibition, an exhibition catalog called Underground Classics, which you may find here, <laughs> amazingly for purchase. Uh, Jim worked for 35 years at the Wisconsin Historical Society and then taught for a decade at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, where he's now emeritus. He uh, founded the Mellon Comics Workshop which, uh, about two years ago, which brings people in to talk about comics and is kind of heading towards the hope of a, of a comic studies program, which I empathize with more than I can say. Uh, and he also founded, over 20 years ago, the Center for the History of Print and Digital Culture. And look, I forgot my phone. I was going to list all the amazing books that Jim has written, uh, because we have them in our library, <laughs> because we have some more. <laughs> uh, so, is it going to come right up? No, it's not going to come right up because my life is so bizarre. <laughs> there it is. Okay. So, in addition to Underground Classics, the transformation of comics with an S and 
X. Uh, he's written Women in Print, Essays on the Print Culture of American Women from the 19th and 20th Centuries, uh, African American Newspapers and Periodicals, a National, Bibli uh, National Bibliography, as a reference to various that love print bibliographies, um, Newspapers in the State Historical Society of Wisconsin, a bibliography withholding, a third bibliography, the German American radical press, the shaping of the left political culture. You can kind of see how we would love Jim. It, uh, it goes on. That's all I'm going to do. That's all I'm going to do, Jim. That's it. <laughs> it's already too much. It's already too much. So, uh, sit, relax. They're going to talk. Howard's got a microphone. Nobody else should feel bad that they don't have a microphone. I'm not going to go into why. Lawrence amazingly volunteered to film this. <laughs> so, I'm so excited. Uh, there's going to be book sales afterwards. You might be able to talk these guys into signing things. Uh, we've got brochures over here about comics at Columbia. We've got these queer comic, queer and comics uh, brochures. There's a little tiny supply of mini comics that Annie Koyama gave me at Mocha Fest this weekend that you're welcome to take. And there's also a sign-up sheet if you're interested in being on the mailing list for future comics events here at Columbia. So I'm going to put this over there, and then I'm going to sit down, and then I'm going to go. Jim, over to you. <laughs> and thank, thank you Karen. all for coming. Thank you, Karen, for the great introduction. No need, no need to read everything that you say. Uh, when I'm on Friday the campus, I feel a need to raise my tone. So, uh, so know that I come to praise that it's not to bury it. Yes, his, his past is now entombed. Uh, with convenient access, of course, in uh, Rare Book and Manuscript Library here at Columbia. In addition to talking about Dennis's work over the decades, the distinguished panelists and the audience, uh, that's you, uh, will, I hope, speak to the importance of archives for comic studies. It's also appropriate to note how central Columbia's Rare Book and Manuscript Library is to print culture. No institution can match Columbia <coughs> for the resources for the history of publishing. Now under the direction of Sean Quimby, Columbia has moved to include comics as part of their resources of publishing history. Mm -hmm. May other institutions be inspired to develop their own holdings in this area, where there's much of great value to collect, regardless of geography. Here, here. I met Dennis on May 6, 1977. I had to look it up. <laughs> I know this so precisely because Dennis came to a conference I'd organized on book publishing in Wisconsin, the State Historical Society. I was already familiar with Dennis's work through early comics such as Mom's Homemade, and especially through regular reading of the Bugle American, the underground alternative newspaper he founded with friends in Madison and later moved to Milwaukee. The Bugle was distributed in Madison where it joined a fertile group of local radical papers advocating, yes, the Troika, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Although Dennis's tastes do not really extend to rock and roll. <laughs> Over the lunch break at of this one-day conference, Dennis and I had a chance to talk about comics, especially the holdings of the Society's uh, iconographic collections where the visual materials of August Durland uh, were held. Durland was a prolific 20th century author, 160 books, um, who helped in invent the pulps, writing under a plethora of pseudonyms with his friend Mark Shore, whose interest included comics. So much so that he subscribed to many newspapers and cut out their comic sections, which he then had bound. But during that break, Dennis told me about his collection of original art from fellow underground uh, artists. And I remarked that wouldn't it be neat, and I probably, yes, really used that word, <laughs> to see that art on the walls of an institution like the Society, something named the Columns and Front Lines Building. Thirty-five years later, Dennis and I co-curated <laughs> underground classics, the transformation of comics into comics, which was exhibited at the Campus Art Museum in Madison and later at the Prince Museum as part of Fumetto in Sarah Switzerland. We were, of course, an overnight sensation. For myself, the larger story is the growing, though still begrudging acceptance of comics in the academy, the present company and situation accepted. Now, comics hardly, hardly belong just to the academy, but they do need to find a place in the courses that we teach and the students we serve. At the University of Wisconsin Madison, this carries one of the organizers of the AWL workshop on comics. Together with colleagues of a wide variety of disciplines, we try to find kindred spirits on our campus in order to raise the profile of comic studies um, as a way of helping both faculty and students. This process has brought me into contact with colleagues from the usual suspects, such as English, journalism, 
Bachelor's studies, but also education, law, and even the medical school, where comics are used to communicate ideas in public health. One of the impediments to comic studies has been a lack of access. Until recently, it was difficult for students to find comics in academic libraries, just as it was for them when they were younger and made use of public libraries in some extent. Comics really comic books, glimpses from Dell and hundreds of other publishers were not considered appropriate for library collections for the most part of the last couple of centuries. I know, I certainly was told repeatedly that I was wasting my money and time reading Book of Scrooge, but it wasn't a title I could have found at the public library. This has changed in many ways. Public libraries acquire all manner of comics, especially graphic novels. Yes, the rebranding has worked. <laughs> and this can include comic books for an academic library, it's usually a less adventurous uh, part of the profession. Not here, but yes. But the changes come more slowly, but they too have been persuaded by graphic novels and graphic nonfiction. We need that second term, it's not all fiction. The more contemporary collections have been augmented by selective reprinting of classic titles by Kitchen Sink in the past, and today by imprints like Abrams, Comic Artists, and Dark Horse, Drawn Court, like IDW, and Fan Graphics, among others. For the broadest coverage, there is the digital library of underground and now more mainstream comics that Dennis and I edit for Alexander Street Press, available at a very well funded university library where he grabs. <laughs> to begin our discussions, Karen invited a wonderful group of artists and scholars. And I've, been invited, I've invited each of them to speak to you for a few minutes before we open the floor to hear from you. For our two scholars, I invite them to speak about their own work, especially the sources they've used. And in terms of sources, I'm hoping for a critical reading of both types, of, such as books, serials, oral histories, and manuscripts, both visual and textual. This will give us a way to think about uh, the wonderful collection of materials that Dennis has uh, helped build and now is here at Columbia. I'm going to introduce our four speakers, uh, our four panelists, and uh, at first, and then let and then and then let them then start talking to themselves. Howard Cruz is the father of gay comics. Just think about it. <laughs> Howard, was, Howard was raised in Spring, Springville, Alabama, the son of a preacher and a homemaker whose first cartoons were published in The Baptist Student, worth collecting if you didn't subscribe. After college in Birmingham, at Birmingham Southern College, uh, Howard moved north to New York City where he met his life partner in the state of Rome. In the decades in between, Howard never stopped drawing and in the 1970s gained attention for Barefoots, his surreal comic creation with a large bare feet. Often the critics found his work too cute for their taste, but his audience, but his audience changed when he began editing Gay Comics, a title that Dennis Kitchen helped create and publish through his Kitchen Sink Press. For this series, uh, Howard created Wendell, a uh, strip of, about a most irrepressible and idealistic gay man that was, uh, that was also published in the Advent, the largest gay circulation circ 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 periodical in the country. Finally, Howard had venues where he was not constrained in his use of language, nudity, or situations. By the 1990s, Howard was occupied writing and drawing his masterpiece, Stuck Rubber Baby, a title that some of you may have encountered in classes on this campus or another. Tolan Polk's coming-of-age story as a gay man in racially divided Alabama has received many accolades. The text is a superb narrative, and the drawings are both strong and evocative. Next, coming this way. Uh, <laughs> Margaret Galvin is a PhD candidate in English at the Graduate Center City University of New York. Her dissertation is entitled Archiving the 80s. That was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Feminism, Queer Theory, and Visual Culture that traces the genealogy of queer theory in the 1980s, but the 1980s feminism through representations of sexuality and visual culture. Her published work includes articles on Alison Beckles, representations of disability, and the study of Kitty Pride and the X Men. Archives are essential to her dissertation, and she's already worked at more than a dozen across the country. Out of this project, she will have an article this fall in Women's Studies Quarterly on Roberta Gregory and Lee Mars, nuanced explorations of sexuality alongside critiques of, fem of the feminist movement in Dynamite Damsels and the further fattening adventures of Pudge. Okay. Like most graduate students, Maggie also teaches for uh, teaches, and here she teaches for uh, NYU's Gallatin School of Individualized Study, as well as serving as an instructional technology fellow at Brooklyn College. To my left, 
Fagan, who is the music critic for the nation and a professor at Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism. Before joining the nation, he served for more than 10 years as the music critic for the New Republic. He is currently at work on a history of popular music to be published by Farrar, Strauss, and Chirou. Among his many wonderfully written books are Lush Life, a biography of Lee Strayhorn, Positive the Fourth Street, The Lives and Times of Joan Baez, Bob Dylan, Mimi Baez, Virginia, and Richard Freeman. And a special note for tonight's purposes, the Tencent Play, The Great Comic Book Scare and How It Changed the Man. Tencent was a finalist for an Eisner Award and editors of Amazon named it the number one uh, best book of the year on the arts. Davis contributions to magazines and alternative news weekly and more began in 1979 with the Village Voice and Rolling Stone and continued with contributions to the American Scholar, the Atlantic Monthly Book for the New Yorker, the New York Review of Books, the New York Times Magazine, the New York Times Book Review, the Vanity Fair, you know, anywhere you'd like to be if you're a writer. Many of these, of course, have been Mr. Ward's for that. Lastly, he is a his is a journalistic career that began in grade school when he wrote and published Dave's News in Phillipsburg, New Jersey. I mention this seemingly obscure title because another child prodigy to my right, Dennis Kitchen, also began his writing and publishing career early on. No wonder they've got so much done. Dennis Kitchen's first publication was Klepto. It was distributed at a high school uh, with the most easy to ridicule name, Corlett High School. <laughs> Dennis had always wanted to be a cartoonist, originally a, uh, a political cartoonist, but when he was told that the art department at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee was not friendly to his interests, he gravitated to journalism. That was only a slightly more fertile ground, uh, though one professor was himself a cartoonist and offered important support. But then there was that moment when Dennis needed a job. It happens to all of us. Out of that predicament came the first notions of being a publisher born by necessity that, that no one no one else would do so. Skilled as a business person since Horlick, Dennis found the funds from stu the student humor magazine to produce his first comic, Mom's Homemade. And the rest is, if not just history, a tale of creating Wisconsin's most successful underground newspaper with the Bureau American, where there was a whole page of comics from Dennis and others. The comics were later syndicated with about 50 other underground college papers. By 1970, Dennis was growing into being a comics publisher, Due to few underground distributors not paying for comics, as well as, as well as being approached by other artists to print and distribute their own works. This was the origin of Kitchen Sink Press, which would come to publish virtually every artist of note in the underground, and many of them close friends of Dennis's. Titles such as Dope Comics and Weird Trips found a ready audience in the 1970s. Who knew? Because Dennis has always had a strong interest in history the history of comics in particular, he reached out to artists of an earlier era like Will Elder, Harvey Kurtzman, and Will Eisner, even Al Cap, and began to reissue their work in new editions. Along the way, he worked with Eisner to publish one of the first graphic novels, A Contract with God, when Will's publisher went broke, and Scott McCloud to publish Understanding Comics, and so much more, including founding the comic book League of Defense Fund. And so, <coughs> Starting with our panelists, and we'll start with Maggie. What's a young woman like you doing on a panel on underground comics? <laughs> <laughs> we know most of the artists were men and did it for their readers, but underground was a long time ago, and here you are. So do you want to hear? Yes. these materials cement the importance of collaboration both on and off the page. 
within comics scholarship, collaboration is undervalued and under-theorized as much of the academic conversation focuses on exceptional authors individually producing longer works. In my own work, I seek to value the importance of interpersonal relationships, collectives, and conversations as they affect and effect the comics page. And I look in particular at female comics artists, except for women comics, um, who have, until recently, been largely neglected by both their form and their politics as silence and silences and genealogies of the underground and women's history evidence. So not just <coughs> they've been ignored by comics, but they've also been ignored by histories of feminism um, as well. So now let's travel back in time. Uh, it's early 1974. Um, Dennis Kitchen is planning an underground S comics series to be published by Marvel that later co comes to be called Comics Book when its first issue is released later that year in October. When it hits the stands, only one of the 20 plus um, contributors in the first issue is a woman. If you read a number of underground comics, you know this imbalance is unsurprising, yet before this issue even goes to print, Kitchen's aware of this problem and wants to include more women, as evidenced in a letter he pens to Trina Robbins, the sole female contributor in his first issue. Both today and contemporarily, Robbins is one of the most under known underground female printrinists, not only because of her strong and varied publication record, but also because of her outspoken promotion of women in comics, you know, in many sort of various forms. Um, in Kitchen's letter to Robbins on March 28th, as he is planning the first issue, he writes, I don't have the addresses of any of the other female cartoonists in the Bay Area. Can you get some in touch with me or send me some addresses? I admire the style the style of Shelby Sampson and certain of the others. And I'd like to open a platform for female cartoonists to reach a mass audience. In letters and postcards that Robbins writes back to Kitchen in late March and early April, she not only asks him to clarify the particulars of the project, but she also promises that she will tell her colleagues, scrawling across the back of the envelope carrying her April 5th correspondence, women's comics meeting this Tuesday, shall show them all your letter. In response to her spreading the word, the other two female artists who come to publish in comics books over to five series, five issue series uh, uh, in the next few years, they make their first contact with Kitchen in early April. So this is a you know, very short period of time. And I, I like the, the fact that even though we send emails and they're so quick and daily, like this is still a very a small period of time. Um, in both of these letters, Lee Mars and Sharon Rudolph mention Robbins as their introduction before asking about the project and discussing their previous work. Rudolph, a less known figure with the underground scene at this juncture, spends the letter talking herself up before ending with an assertive bang. I've been in comics less than two years, a painter, underground journalist, and pornographer before that, but I learned fast and I'm getting too good to ignore. <laughs> Her sentiment speaks not only to Rudolph's personal experiment, experience, but it resonates more generally with the contemporaneous experience of women in comics that Kitchen sought to rectify. These exchanges as a whole evidence the importance of personal networks to finding and developing <coughs> comics artists. As other parts of the correspondence show cartoonists finessing their comics plots in conversations with Kitchen and others. Rudolph's end claim, I'm getting too good to ignore, today also aligns with the position and history of comics in academia more generally. To say it succinctly, um, sustained academic attention on comics has only emerged in the recent past and prioritizes, as I said earlier, largely single creator long graphic works that are also often autobiographical, like Art Spiegelman's Mouse or Alison Bechdel's Fun Home. And yet the collaborative communal energies of comics touched both of these authors. In the second issue of the aforementioned comics book series, Kitchen Sink Press reprinted an early three-page version of Maps. Further, Bechdel was inspired to start making comics by Gay Comics, a series that grew out of the energies of the underground when it debuted in 1980 and was, at its outset, published by Kitchen Sink Press and edited by Howard Cruz. My own work on comics and on visual culture more generally depends on archives for its very existence. With comics, archives are not just important for preserving records about the comics, but often for preserving the comics themselves. Many of the underground comics are only now being reprinted, and while these reprints are valuable for making the comics more accessible again, they invariably alter original context and prioritize more well-known authors or series. 
I first widely read these underground comics themselves in archival spaces on the Alexander Street Press online database that Karen actually helped me get access to because we didn't have access at CUNY. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now we do, so yeah. <laughs> but also at Michigan State, at Washington State, and here in New York also at the Lesbian History Archives, which has a lot of um, really cool um, stuff. Um, this new collection represents a major coup for researchers. Since, since Kitchen Sing Press was a long time hub for cartoonists, and also because of the meticulousness of Kitchen's records, as he kept copies of his own correspondence alongside the correspondence um, that was coming to him. He preserved envelopes, so at the back of the envelope, um, and he stamped letters with dates or receipts, so you have dates on everything. See what you can I look forward to the nuanced conversations that will emerge around this rich collection both tonight and in future research. Thank you. start with that and, and I'll just give you a signal when you place it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the could call prehistory of comics, the event, the prehistory of underground comics, a series of events that uh, led to the underground movement. Uh, underground. If you it, it struck me that the uh, strikes me that the default term for to define underground is, is revolutionary. And in fact, the press release for uh, Karen said uh, for uh, to announce procuring the kitchen sink archive, describe okay, we must right, describe the underground movement as revolutionary. If you if you do a Google search of the words underground comics and revolutionary, you find seventeen thousand. Now, I'm not sure. I'm not really up on my metric science, so I don't even know if that's a lot. But <laughs> if my son has a Tumblr, so he probably has 17,000 followers. He's 11 years old. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it seems like a lot to me. Uh, and so the idea, one does find the, the idea of revolution, the idea of the revolutionary in the discourse about underground comics, in the discourse of the world that Kitchen Sink occupied and kind of leadership and role in. The revolution is a uh, reactive phenomenon. The revolution, the revolution reacts against something, revolting against something. So what was what were the underground comics uh, revolting against? Uh, I don't know, we all know in broad terms the conservatism of the 50s and 60s uh, era the commercialism of products for profit, mass production for mass audience, with the dumbing down to the lowest common denominator that that implies, um, regimentation and uniformity and conventionality that comes with mass production, the slickness of the goods and the slickness of popular art made in mass quantities under corporate sponsorship for mass audience. All of that, all of that is what the underground movement and the 60s were revolting against. And in the world of comics in particular, all that uh, was manifest to a significant degree by uh, the Comics Code and its effect. The Comics Code, uh, which, in which, in which the corporate uh, institutional comic, comics industry self was self-regulated itself. Self-regulated itself? <laughs> it's a mechanism of self-regulation. Uh, self-regulating code of self-censorship that the comics industry uh, took up in a fear that uh, regulation and censorship left in the hands of the government would be more onerous. Uh, there's no knowing if that's true, considering how onerous the comics code was. It would, be, it would be really hard to imagine a code that would be more restrictive and more onerous than the comics code. So the world that of the 50s and 60s, the world that the comics code created in the comics world, is the world that the, revolution, the underground comics were, were, were you know, uh, revolting against. Now, I interviewed because of my own methodology, and I'm going to talk a little later about uh, archives and such in my own work, but I, I'm a journalist, 
by training and by practice for the most part, I write books of history. Uh, my son is a graduate, my oldest son, not the one who was a graduate from <laughs> the University of Wisconsin, studied history at the University of Wisconsin, and he calls me a fake historian. Uh, so, because I use mostly the journalistic method, I like to uh, write about the events that, are with, that for which there are uh, living uh, observers and living participants who can provide unvarnished first-hand testimony about their experience in those events. That's the way I like to work. And one of the reasons is that I like to, I like to un I try to un tell untold stories stories that aren't necessarily documented by secondary sources. Like my first book was about Billy Strait, one of the gay jazz composers. Practically nothing written about it. Another way to tell this story was to find primary sources, witnesses of the, of the, of the events in his life. And the same thing also to a significant degree with the 10 cent play. So over five or six years, I found one hundred of the first-hand witnesses uh, of these events. One of the people I uh, Oh, it's almost tax day. I was thinking about this today. <laughs> One of the people who I interviewed for this was Brother Tom. Uh, and I, you know, one of the burdens of this kind of research is that of having to go to the south of France <laughs> for three days uh, and to visit his chalet and his this and the walled city. So I actually did not write that off. I kind of said, we'll never believe this. And this will flag you. <laughs> I just ate in the three days in the South Carolina. So as to not be caught. This is on tape. <laughs> and as a matter of goodwill, generosity, and support, our fine government. <laughs> uh, so Crom said, uh, in my interview with him, he described how the undergrounds were a reaction to repression. He said, people forget that that's what it was all about. That's why we did it. We didn't have anybody standing over us saying, no, you can't draw this, you can't show that. You could do whatever you wanted with the undergrounds. But Crum uh, had a passion, fascination for the the obsession. Actually, he all his fascinations <laughs> across the border into <laughs> obsession. <laughs> uh, among them, uh, among his early obsessions, was uh, one of the DC comics. Uh, DC comics are pretty significant in prehistory that led to the underground movement. But a number, a number of the underground comics artists who I interviewed for this book brought up DC comics. And they, they talked to me about the significance of DC in their world view in their sense of mission. And I started to see their view as kind of a, you know, what we would call in Columbia, like a predapsarian idealization of the world before the fall. And I'm serious about that. This idea that the world was better right before your time. <laughs> and then everything went to hell. <laughs> so, so Crum describes to me, that he said, by the time I was old enough to appreciate DC and Mad Magazine, it was all over. The great stuff was over. I just caught the tail end of the comic book man. That made me a nostalgist in the young age and a seeker of the culture of the past in the young age. A lot of cultural things declined during the 50s, and for me as a kid, that made me start searching for the past. So he had this. Uh, EC was very, very uh, significant. So it's a combination of the radical content of EC comics, what it represented at, at its time, the consequences of what it did, and then also what it came to represent in the imagination of the next generation of artists who were the rising generation of underground artists. So all these things sort of came together. Crumb said in also this interview, and also, me and the other guys who ended up drawing underground comics grew up loving those crazy comic books of the pre code period, pre left period, or the devil, or FC's Father, or you know, the comics go before the devil came, uh, when the comics had a lot of vitality. We talked about that. So here's a publication making fun 
highly respected American institutions in the square and military post-World War II environment, and doing so in a crude, weird way. So he's seeing the aesthetic values in the undergrounds, weirdness, and crudity. He's seeing them in that. Here was this vision of America that countered all the stilt-upon, goody-two-shoes, 50s propaganda, totalitarian vision that was put forth in the media, the schools, and everything, and all the evil institutions. He was absolutely obsessed with DC. I put together a couple slides that in my remaining minute and a half of the opening presentation on the history. There's some kids here. You guys. I wanted you to see this because underground comics are often thought of as the first comics that were made for adults. Comics grew up with the underground before comics, before the underground comics were kids. And for the fact, uh, it is true that most of the kids read comics uh, in the 30s and into the uh, mid 40s. However, <coughs> well, there is statistical, there, there were quite a few surveys conducted of uh, comics readership that were, that were uh, documented by the uh, Comics uh, Trade Association and reported in papers, and some psychologists did some independent studies and, 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 as well. And they showed that somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of comics, even in the 30s and 40s, were written by people who were written by red by. Actually, they were written by people. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Written and read by people who were after between 16 and 18. That's true. Uh, young people were making comics for other young people, and some young adults were making comics for other young adults. Uh, but the fact that some people, 20, 25 percent of people over 16, were reading comics doesn't tell us much about the content of those comics. Because the content, the content was still juvenile. So this, these were all the people getting, enjoying comic, or comics that were generally speaking, broadly speaking, uh, juvenile. Then something happened. Uh, if you were 14 years old in 1939, uh, and 10 years passed, and it's 1949, uh, you're 24. So a generation who were adolescents in 1939, when comics 38, 39, when comics started, are now in their early 20s. And what happened is comic, com comics matured along with the readership for what we did. Well, we see the first 10 years of uh, comics history. But we knew the comic books were supposed to stay for kids. They grew up with the readers. Now the generation of people who were 20, before 1949, uh, also endured World War II, either by the fighting the war, reading comics in the war, experiencing the bloodshed, of the horrors of World War II, or dealing with it from the home, on the home front, by making sacrifices and uh, being touched by the death and the horrors of the war of their family, uh, and their loved ones, and, and, the, and the, uh, the neighborhoods and towns. So the, this generation did a lot of growing up in those 10 years since we and, and the comics grew up at the same time. Now, we, so we find by 1949, late 1950s, 1950s, a new kind of comics coming up that are meant for 24-year-olds, you know, for teenagers and young adults. But there are parallels to film noir. They're, they're telling sort of dark stories and very adult stories uh, about and salacious stories about you know, cheating you know, husbands and wives and, uh, and crime. Some of them were contrary and some of them were violent. And the best among them were made by EC Comics. We show, okay, go ahead with a couple of slides. And I have a slide of, uh, oh, I'm just one of my minions. Please, take care of this for me. <laughs> Uh, let's see, these are some kids, and then you know, Metal Supplies. <laughs> Stanley Morris was the publisher of that, and when I was searching my book, he was still alive. And my, my experience with comics in, in, in archives is to, uh, a testament to the value of archives. I didn't have them. I needed them desperately. And I was able to find Stanley Morris by looking into one page of the phone book and see, Morse comma standard view, and he was still alive. And I could call him in the phone books, I'm looking for Stanley Morse, he used to do comics on 
speaking, <laughs> uh, it's not so easy anymore. And then we have uh, Bill Gaines on the left and Alpha C, and then the publisher at NRG DC Comics, uh, at the Theater of Restaurant Patrice's in Little Italy. Here they are working late into the night. Uh, and here are some of the comics that they did. They, uh, this is based on a, uh, on a Poe story. Here we have a set of a pair of conniving couples that transgress the 50s ideal of domestic bliss and like utopian suburbanism. Like here we have this modern furniture and they're like look like a model Hollywood couple and they're just down to you know, undo each other and you know kill each other because suburbia is such hell. It's very, very radical stuff. Um, a lot of sympathy for outcast misfits and pentamonic creatures, I should say of all kinds including aliens, uh, <coughs> monsters, and other kinds of outcasts and misfits, outliers, outsiders. Some, um, some of this sympathy is expressed through the code of science fiction and, and folk, folk uh, genres and some of it is uh, more conventional. Here we have the legendary uh, baseball game within the body parts. <laughs> drawn by Jack Davis, and beautiful work by Ralph Krigstein that shows a very elevated conception of what comics can be. Look at this, in the late 1940s, early 1950s, this is a group of artists, writers, and publishers who were taking this art form very seriously as an art form. And needless to say, this uh, had to be stopped. So, <laughs> 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 uh, documentation of some comic book earnings, that I have mostly some of the archives groups subscribing to newspaper.com and going and going through literally thousands and thousands and thousands of papers. And then my method was to find a report of the burning at St. Patrick's Academy in Binghamton, New York. Uh, going to Binghamton, New York, going to the library, finding a high school uh, yearbook from that year, which is here and it's in my office. Now. Because I found one of the students who gave it to me. Writing down all those names and then going through the phone book for Binghamton, New York, in hopes that these people were kids in the early 1950s. They still were. And I found five or six of them and interviewed them. So I interviewed five of those kids and burning those comics. Uh, yeah. And I did this. <laughs> uh, and anyway, I'm going to cut this short because we all know the tragic story of the position of the Comics Code and its consequences uh, ended with the shutting down of dozens of comics companies, hundreds of people were put out of work, comics became even more uh, juvenile than ever, and all the happy ending of all this is it gave the undergrounds uh, something to revolt against. <laughs> Not just yet. Not just yet. Not just yet. I have to turn on his microphone. Is this live? Yeah. Uh, excuse me for this. I uh, I have a throat issue, and I'm under doctor's orders not to try to project seriously. Uh, so that's the reason I'm alone here. I uh, have a microphone. Um, I'm also uh, alone here. Well, no, that's not true. This is true of Dennis, too. I'm not an academic, although Dennis is infinitely uh, more well-read than I am. Uh, but uh, I'm a sample underground cartoonist, and they dug up <laughs> this show. Uh, because I, uh, I have a long history with Dennis. Uh, I uh, grew up wanting to have a newspaper strip and do conventional cartooning, uh, but then I uh, 
got into theater for a while and was became aware of how an art form could really have depth and be worth the attention of serious adults and the contrast between the comics that I was seeing around at the time uh, and what I was learning to do in theater were so great that I, I lost interest. It was underground comics uh, that made me realize uh, that, oh, you can actually do comics that have a connection, a real roots in the kind of life experience uh, that people actually have, which in my generation was largely being a hippie. Uh, so I don't know how typical that is. But anyway, I was uh, part of the counterculture and uh, was very influenced in my worldview by experiences I had with psychedelic drugs and the general uh, expansion of the notion of the possibilities uh, of life uh, and underground comics dovetailed uh, with that new broadened perspective and, and made me feel there was a place for me after all in cartooning and uh, however I was sort of you'd probably call me if a th the third wave and the third wave of underground cartoonists uh, conceivably the second wave but probably the third wave uh, by the time that I came along, all of the big names had had their impact. Uh, Robert Crumb, S. Clay Wilson, um, uh, a bunch of other names that I can't recall now because I'm getting older and my memory for names is going. Uh, but anyway, the people who did the original Zap comics, uh, who basically gave the form its reputation for breaking taboos and being outrageous and doing stuff that would freak out um, so-called straight America and uh, that all the kids love because every generation loves to freak out its elders. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, by the time I came along and wanted to sort of inject my view that was affected by the counterculture experience as one had in Birmingham, Alabama in the early 70s. Um, I, uh, I didn't feel there were a lot of taboos left to break. Uh, you have to go some to figure out how, how to be more outrageous than S. Clay Wilson. <laughs> uh, I just didn't feel it was, it wasn't my temperament. I was interested in more of a kind of a <laughs> spiritual, cosmic view. Uh, uh, questioning the nature of reality, which is the kind of thing that you tend to do if you take a lot of LSD. <laughs> and uh, so those were finding their way into my comics, and I had a mode of kind of couching these sort of subversive elements in a very, uh, in a style that looked like it could fit in the average newspaper uh, page. It, and this is why I got the rap uh, for being too cute uh, for underground comics, because the characters, if you just looked at them, uh, they didn't look uh, revolutionary at all. Uh, I like to think there was a subtext which if people pay some attention to it, they would realize that there was a bunch of different levels going on. Uh, some people got this and some people didn't. Um, Dennis uh, got it, uh, which I really appreciate uh, because when I looked at what was happening in San Francisco, which was the biggest uh, collection of underground cartoons in those days, there was no reason to think that any of those people would like me or what I did. I would just have no place. I would be the kid on the you know, far end of the playground um, as far as they were concerned. And in fact, I was, uh, particularly being from Alabama. Uh, but I uh, saw an ad that Dennis placed, or, or a notice at least, I placed in, I think, the writer's yearbook, um, which was a relatively conventional uh, place uh, to, to advertise um, markets for different forms of creativity, including uh, you know writing, drawing, and in this case, comics. Uh, Dennis said, okay, I have this operation going, kitchen sink comics uh, in Wisconsin at the time, and uh, so you should send me some stuff. So I sent him, I drew up as weird and psychedelic a page as I think of and sent it to him and he rejected it. Uh, the comment that uh, it seemed, uh, per the humor seemed perhaps a little obscure. You know how you remember these phrases decades later. 
But meanwhile, I uh, was doing my strip barefoot for local underground papers and uh, school papers, and and it. Um, I saw one of the Dennis sent along some copies of the comics that he was publishing at the time, and one uh, that made an impression on me, even though it hasn't sort of lingered uh, as one that a lot of people remember or are aware of, was called OK Comics, about a character named OK Cabibolo. And uh, this was, the pictures in that looked, they were quiet, they were meditative, uh, they were not trying to uh, be shocking at every moment. And it made me think, well, you know, Dennis is not as obsessed with the shock value as maybe uh, the San Francisco crowd was. And uh, so I just, I sent him uh, my barefoot strips, a bunch of them collected uh, from the underground papers and uh, school papers that I had done them for in the first place, and he uh, liked them. And uh, so he began placing them in his anthology books. And because of that start, uh, that was in 1972, I think, the first time that I, uh, when I made contact with him. And uh, so Dennis and I go through all these intervening years of the uh, near collapse of underground comics uh, as a result of the 1963 Supreme Court decision that changed all the rules about obscenity uh, and made uh, because uh, Kitchison didn't have a lot of spare money for, you know, buying, do, paying for the whole thing at the time. And because of that, not only I got a further foothold in underground comics, but uh, Dennis had some more books in his list uh, to promote. And uh, this next point, when he asked me uh, if I would be interested in editing a new series called Gay Comics, because uh, Dennis had become aware we had talked about the fact that I was gay some years before, and Dennis thought I would be a good person to edit this. And uh, when you talk about trying to find female cartoonists, try to find a bunch of uh, uh, gay and lesbian cartoonists who may, have, may or may not have made the world aware that they were gay. Um, so we sent out a letter uh, to the world, to everybody, to all the cartoonists, uh, saying, uh, we don't know if you're gay or not, but in case you are, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is perfect. If you're not gay, you are, you have gay friends, your cartoonist friends, show it to them, please. And, uh, and also, I have become aware of the work of uh, uh, Roberta Gregory and Mary Wings, two pioneering lesbian cartoonists, and Lee Mars, who included gay material in her pledge, play, pledge, girl blood, girl blood. Uh, and uh, to my delight, because I did not want this to be a single gender project, uh, we were able to get all of these uh, very talented people, very talented women in early, and also a bunch of, uh, un, you know, many more gay male cartoonists than I might have thought uh, were willing to take the step, which was a real career risk. And I myself was taking a career risk doing that. But this was a time of, of anti-gay campaigns that were, uh, that were really demanded to be uh, responded to in a number of ways, and one of the ways was in you know, the art form that we were most familiar with. And so gay comics turned out to have a lingering impact, and uh, as you'll see by the fact that uh, we're having queers and comics uh, conferences now. Uh, so anyway, I, uh, you know, will not rattle on and on, but I'll see where the conversation takes us. But the point is, at this point, Dennis uh, is uh, now my agent for a number of books that I've published. He has been a major enabler of me throughout my career, and I uh, am deeply appreciative you know, uh, of what he's done for comics and what he's done for my personal ability to be creative in my own way. Here. <laughs> I'm sure it was meant to. 
<laughs> again. And, and, and I, I, I knew it was a double entendre, but I thought it was appropriate since uh, the comics industry for anybody who knows anything about it. It's a, much akin to an insane asylum in many ways. It's a, it's a crazy place to do business. And when I started out, I knew absolutely nothing about publishing. I was, as Jim pointed out in his earlier paper, I was an aspiring cartoonist. And I would have been very happy to have found a publisher who would publish my own work. But I self-published out of necessity at the beginning. And um, I was in Milwaukee, which is not exactly a place one gets a foot into the business. I was right out of college. I had originally done uh, comics that I intended for the college humor magazine that I co-founded. And uh, <coughs> the editor um, ran off with the money, so there, was, there were no funds. So I found myself with three quarters of a comic, and I thought, well, what the heck, I'll finish it myself, I'll, I'll self-publish it. I knew nothing about printing either. I went to a local printer, I told him how much money I had, and he said, well, I can print 4,000 copies. So I said, all right, that's how we determined the print run. <laughs> I knew nothing about distribution. Uh, I actually called a couple of magazine distributors in the uh, Yellow Pages, I actually met with one, and I realized how completely and totally naive it was to try to work with a professional distributor. So I did what uh, just seemed like common sense to me. I literally went around and schlepped my comics to every local shop, starting with the friendly head shops, to my corner druggist, to the used bookstores. And uh, to me, it was just, uh, what, what else can you do? It was something born out of a necessity. I consigned them. I'd say, if you take a stack, we'll come back in a couple of weeks, pay me two months or so. And uh, I actually had a, a form they filled out, and to my astonishment, I'd go back, the stack would be gone, they'd take another stack. That summer, and that was the summer of 1969, I sold 3,500 copies just in the east side of Milwaukee, which, in retrospect, was pretty remarkable. <laughs> I had a roommate who basically said, I'm getting out of Milwaukee, I'm going to San Francisco, where all the action is. And he said, I see you got a carton of books left. So I'll throw them in the trunk, see if I can sell them out there. And I said, great. He took them to the largest, maybe the only comic shop in San Francisco at the time, run by a guy named Gary Arlington. And, uh, and Gary took all 500, and he sold out within a short period of time. And he called me to get more. And, and I said, well, I don't have any more. I, I sold them all, and I spent all the money. That <laughs> <laughs> My career in journalism, uh, Taken me to this. So, point is, he knew uh, the guys who owned the print minute, which was the preeminent underground publisher. They were the ones who did Zap. And they called and they said, We'll happily reprint this for you. And if you've got a second book, we'll publish that. And I said, Great. This is what I was <clears throat> always wanting to happen. And then a curious thing happened. Um, basically, I was hounding them for uh, you know, some money. <laughs> publishing those comics, and eventually I got an envelope in the mail with a check and nothing with it. And I, I called the, uh, the fellow who was my contact there, and I said, uh, thanks for the check, but I thought maybe there'd be uh, some indication of how many you printed and what percentage you're paying me, because we never really talked about that. And uh, they seemed perfectly reasonable questions. And he said, well, uh, are you calling me a crook? <laughs> and at that moment it occurred to me, well, that, that was a distinct possibility. <laughs> he could have even made up the numbers. If I had just gotten a sheet of paper that said he printed X and this was a percentage, I, I would have happily accepted it. But nothing seemed to me uh, just the wrong way to go about doing business. So I remember uh, pulling my comics from him and deciding I was going to self-publish again. And at that time, I was in touch with the guys in Chicago, Skip Williamson and Jay Lynch, who were doing Bijou Funnies. That printment was also publishing. And uh, Jay said, yeah, we're having trouble with them, too. We don't trust them either. And uh, he said, if you're going to self-publish and distribute your own, would you do ours, too? And I very naively said, and I'll never forget these words, I said, sure, two is as easy as one. <laughs> I'm not even sure what that means. <laughs> but once I said that, I didn't remember, these were friends of mine. Uh, they were also guys 
long hair and scraggly beards like me, and we were part of this this thing. You could call it the, the counterculture movement, hippies, freaks, whatever you want to say. There was absolutely a sense of camaraderie. And when I told them I would do it, I, I absolutely meant it. And so suddenly I had to keep careful books and accounting, and I had to start learning about printing, and I had to start figuring out how to distribute comics outside East Side of Milwaukee. So what I had actually <coughs> had in it, one advantage was the underground paper that I had co-founded, the, the Bugle American, was exchanging with other papers around the country. And after a day or two, I mean, people in the staff would kind of look at them and toss them. I would save them, and I'd go through and I'd find ads in the back for all the head shops, and I started mailing this, and I started mailing a catalog to these head shops. One thing led to another, and pretty soon I was getting orders from all over the country. And so, point is, I had no background whatever to publish comics. I had never in college taken a single practical course uh, in terms of a business course, accounting, marketing, anything that would have been helpful. I did not take it. <laughs> <laughs> and to get to the papers that are now in Columbia, uh, there's another practical thing, which is uh, about a year, a little over a year ago, uh, Karen uh, said they uh, truck and picked up about 200 boxes of paper from me and included there was an estimated 50 to 60,000 letters. We don't know the exact amount, Karen's still counting it. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's long occurred to me that had I even taken a typing course in high school, it would have been helpful. <laughs> had I any idea I was going to type that many letters, I would have learned to type. <laughs> um, I have probably the thing fastest right index finger in the country because when I type, it's, it's a variable <laughs> word, but it's still basically a one finger method and I, I get about 45 words a minute. It's too late to learn how to type the proper way. <laughs> so the point is I did nothing right whatsoever. <laughs> and I ended up with this damn publishing company. But once I did, I took it very seriously and uh, I loved the medium and I sought out, starting with local cartoonists in Milwaukee, Chicago, and a guy named Robert Crumb was passing through Chicago, and Jay brought him up to Milwaukee, and we did it off instantly. It helped that I had a jukebox in my apartment that played 78 RPM records, <laughs> so that was a commonality. And basically, one step at a time, I learned how to become a practical businessman. I also, I should mention, was a card carrying socialist at the time. So it's like, it was kind of embarrassing. And, uh, you know, I'd go to the socialist meetings and they mostly blue collar guys. I know some of them probably the age I am now or, or older. I was part of the youth movement. And, uh, and they'd say, you know, so, so what are you doing now, Dennis? And I said, well, I started this company. And <laughs> I, I was describing this very entrepreneurial enterprise which they kind of furrowed their eyebrow at because it sounded dangerously capitalistic. And I felt guilty about that. So actually, my first letterhead is uh, an octopus. And each tentacle is holding a real or perceived division of the company. And he's wearing a bowler with a dollar sign and smoking a cigar. And, and that was my idea of making fun of myself. I was never comfortable, for political reasons, uh, uh, making money out of it. In fact, um, Profit was not one of those things that was a concern. If I was able to pay the bills uh, and there was money left over, great. But I didn't have a business plan in any conventional sense. What I had was the advantage of a very hungry marketplace. And as anybody knows anything about business, and eventually I learned this, when you have a demand that exceeds the supply, that's a good thing. <laughs> and that's what I had. I had a lot of hippies who wanted to read comics. So in my initially very hand uh, in an awkward way, I figured out how to fill that need. Uh, had it been a normal marketplace, I mean, I don't think it would last that long. But it worked. And gradually, I became a little smarter, and gradually I started uh, finding partners or hiring people who were smart where I wasn't. And I tried to focus on what I did best, which I thought was I had a good eye for talent. People like Howard and many others, who it was a great pleasure over the years to uh, 
publish and to get to know. And one of the reasons I saved all those letters, not just because I'm kind of the OCD about that sort of thing, but these were friends and a lot of the letters were beautiful. They were hand lettered, sometimes illustrated. People would send in sketches for ideas for covers and stories and it seemed a shame to throw that away. They're so intrinsically beautiful. And obviously by the time the, the 90s rolled around, I discovered email like everyone else. And email is a, obviously much faster and much more efficient way of communicating. And I embraced it. But I have to say, even today, I miss opening those letters and seeing handwritten letters and all those things. But thankfully, I saved them, and they're here. And I hope future scholars and historians like David and Maggie and many others will find it useful because comics now are being taken seriously in a way they certainly weren't when I was growing up. I, I love comics, but if anyone at the time had, had said someday these are going to be at Columbia University, that would have been pure science fiction, I assure you. Um, so I'm glad I had the luck or the foresight to save the stuff and that it's here and that I'm being institutionalized. <laughs> Thank you. Two I was connected with that actually made it to the big screen were The Crow and From Hell. There are a lot of others that were optioned and, like most things, ended up in, in Option Hell. Um, the, uh, we, we never, to my knowledge, ever set out and said, oh, this will make a great movie. And always, always, this will be a great comic or an entertaining comic. If Hollywood comes calling, that was always secondary. So. We were never consciously thinking of it. Again, it's like the distant cousin who visits at Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah. One thing that's kind of similar though is that, yeah, is that comic studies has great envy for where film studies have gone. Because the film studies, film studies is a respected part pretty much anywhere uh, in, in, in academia. And comic studies wants to get there too. So it's, a, it's definitely a model for anybody who's looking to build a comic studies program. Well, when you showed that David Crockett kid, that first thing, where you came with what I bought back memories. And I guess two or three quick comments. First, I remember how boys were caught with comic books in New York public schools in the late 50s, early 60s. They were sent to detention. 
Uh, if you call it Mad, Mad, Mad Magazine, we're sent to a guidance counselor. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of, uh, I never heard the term underground comics at the time. I was a voracious consumer of the product. We always referred to it as free comics or head comics. Never did I hear the term underground comics. And that sort of gives an indication of how you receive the comics. Uh, and finally, Zap comic books, I mean, I used to use that as a label organizer to break the ice with guys when I was trying to organize the shop. Because they were guys who'd grown up reading comic books and they loved it. So there was a real subversive practicality to these comics that, you know, sometimes I think gets lost on, you know, people forget how this was, they were just really subversive at the time. And I wanted to ask the distribution issue. You know, you're talking about how this demand is like you're, 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 you're producing it. How are you, how is everybody selling those? It like sort of like what you were just talking about, writ large all over the place? How are they sold? How, well, I know they were sold head shops and I, you know, I'd buy them there, but, but, but how many were being made? How, how, how was that um, morphing at the time or not? Well, at, at the essence, uh, the, the round number we kind of uh, settled on was 10,000 as an initial print run. In other words, if I didn't think a, a comic could sell 10,000, I wouldn't publish it. That was considered the kind of the economic cornerstone. And uh, unlike, uh, say, Marvel or DC newsstand comics that had to come out on a regular schedule, monthly, bi-monthly, whatever, we didn't have those restrictions. We could take our time. You know, dope number one came out this month. Maybe dope number two came out in November. But basically, we would reprint the book as long as it would keep selling because it wasn't distributed in the conventional way, which uh, the guy literally came to the corner drugstore and took last month's comics off and replaced them with the new one. And uh, you know, the old system, Paul Levitz is here, he knows it as well as anyone. In the old days, you know, they would just tear the, half the cover off and that was the affidavit to, to indicate how many were unsold versus sold. And that was big business, you're talking probably uh, in those days, I think a minimum was 100,000 probably for a comic. Probably at the time you were talking about 250,000. Yeah. So by those standards, we were still relatively small fry. But for alternative press, I can't tell you how many people you know who have self-published any kind of magazine or book or poetry. I mean, they died for 10,000. So that would be our starting point. And then uh, we'd get reorders. And so we would typically print another 10 and another 10. So eventually the, the demand slackened off. So the uh, average underground probably 25,000 or so. The really good ones would exceed 100,000. So, um, Zaps were in a class of their own. Freak Brothers was in a class of their own. So those are the ballpark numbers. You had to always be careful too because it was in Zap form and they were called by. So I time I think I've ever had one passed to me from under the counter. Oh, in, in Madison, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's uh, it, you, yeah. you couldn't find it. was actually found obscene in New York. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So I have a question because it's always struck me as, as, as odd that um, in 1957 you have Norman Mailer's The White Negro, you have like Kerouac Celebration of the Negro and On the Road, and then in, in the late 60s in San Francisco you have, you know, the, the Black Panther Party, the Weather Underground, um, and all this stuff, but there's, there seems to be a, sort of no consideration of any of that representation of any of that in the underground. So I was always just curious, and since I have you all here, um, why do you think that is? Why, why was it such that, you know, if you were sort of reading for that in things published during this period, you have no idea the civil rights movement would even happen, right? So you know, why do you think that was? Well, Howard certainly talks about that in Stuck Rubber Baby, right. which was later. But that's much more later. At the time, I can tell you, uh, Margaret talked about how I tried to recruit women cartoonists. I, I tried to do the same thing with black cartoonists. Mm -hmm. there, there were not many. I only found two in all the time I was looking. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure why. I can't answer that. Um, but it wasn't for lack of trying. I do want to mention um, Larry Fuller, who was an African-American cartoonist from the San Francisco area. And I think he published the first black superhero comic. It was a parody called Heaven. Mm -hmm. 
and he also published Gay Heart Throb. Yeah. Kind of the so there, there were black people doing comics, but they're kind of hidden. Right. And I should also think there was an interesting uh, cartoonist, uh, Gary Caldwell, who I don't know actually what his racial background white. is. He's white. He's white, but he sure did black comics. Right. <laughs> <laughs> really, a very, uh, he was very tuned into um, you know, the black culture of revolution and everything of the period. And, uh, and uh, there was an artist named Grass Green. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, I think you have to look at what are the kinds of things that make people feel that they can express their ambitions and go for their ambitions. And cartooning is a kind of a rarefied ambition for a lot of people, particularly if they're, you know, struggling. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's so many greater struggles going on uh, during the 60s, uh, you know, from black, a black experience that uh, perhaps might be surprising it took a while for, you know, those who felt, uh, who had a talent for cartooning to feel that there would be a place for them. So, you know, it, it's a puzzlement, though, because uh, comics have always been a home for the disenfranchised people. They've always been, uh, the, the medium has always been hospitable. <laughs> people felt like they were, they were outside. And in the early days, the comics were made mostly by, by, by immigrants. And, there are a lot of women in comics. I'm, I'm baffled by this too. I mean, there were people who were publishing comics not in the underground, who were of different race, class, um, background. I mean, I'm looking through feminist periodicals now and finding a lot of, um, you know, a wide range of comics that, of people that were never known or never published from the other underground. So there are other um, distribution places. There's um, a lot of new work coming out right now about Black Panther Party and the artwork of Black Panther Party. There's a lot of women who are involved in the artwork of there. So there's a lot of visual production that's going on um, in different sorts of avenues um, and areas. I, I just think somebody like, like Henry Douglas with the Panther, I don't, I don't think, I don't know that there were ever any contemporary collections for his various art. I mean, it, it, it certainly has a a fine art career later, but uh, it has, I think anyone reading the Panther would say, well, this was a great deal on cartooning to me. Right. Yeah. We could have done what we did with the gay crowd. We sent out a form letter that said, are you black? I was obsessed with his work during the early 70s when he was uh, doing it. Yeah, that can not really get comments out No, the interesting thing it could very well have been an issue of access. Because I'm just remembering the Wayne Shorter, the jazz saxophonist, mm -hmm. uh, always wanted to be a cartoonist. He wanted to be a cartoonist first. Uh, oh, God. And <laughs> he saved some of his cartoons, and they've been, they've been published. But, and he wrote about feeling that the back area was just really close to him. That was impossible. I mean, to think that, oh, having a successful career in jazz, that was more viable. I'm also that Louis uh, Bluey, that mm -hmm. documentary by Terry Zvigo, Mark Bogan and Armstrong. Armstrong was an inspiring cartoonist, <clears throat> massive cartoon diaries, but never published them. Mm -hmm. so, so, was it a wonderful exhibit at the uh, Studio Museum in Harlem. It's not the way shorter from but uh, and it shows his work from his college years in Texas and so forth. What he does definitely comes to this. You and then you and then you. Well, this is a little later, but I'm obviously you know, Press had a tremendous impact on comics coming into the book market. And so in my early days of trying to write about that, I came to reference to you. What was it like? I mean, trying to get, I mean, as I recall, I mean, there was very limited distribution. Yeah, into it was, a, it was very frustrating. Little, little yeah. bit, but retailers didn't really like it. It was not charitable. Like, just like the, you know, a comic shop is only started by someone who's passionate about comics, normally. <laughs> and, uh, and likewise, I, I, I tried to find 
bookstores where the bookstore owner was interested in comics. And usually it was just happenstance. We would, I would buy mailing lists and we'd send catalogs and you know, some tiny percentage would come back with a note and he says, you know, hey, I'd like to try some of your books in my store. And then, you know, you, you, you grow in that. At one point, uh, I hooked up with uh, Berkeley as a distributor. And um, this was early on. I think Fantagraphics and First Comics and I were the, the three who were experimenting. And it was very frustrating for me because uh, Twice a year they would have these sales meetings and they would usually have them at a golf course in Puerto Rico, <laughs> which I, I didn't understand why that was necessary. But, but I remember Berkeley had about 40 sales reps in all head territories around the country. And I noticed that there were two of the sales reps that were enthused. One was from New England, one was from Chicago, and their sales were way disproportionate because they really talked up the stuff. The others, it's like, Selling widgets. They had. This is in the prehistoric days of graphic novels, and you could tell them how important contract with God was or something, but they didn't get it. Like a religious book. They, they didn't get it. <laughs> uh, First comics had the most success, and I remember and I thought, why is this stuff selling better than me? So I, I sidled up to him at the bar one night in Puerto Rico, and I, I said, to Rick, why are they selling so many more of your books? I'm just curious. And he said. I play golf with the reps. Why do you think I'm here? <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, my question was uh, it's about uh, what were the rights for, I mean, the originals, who kept the originals, what were the rights for the artists, and if you could say the page rates. The page rates and the rights? I can tell you absolutely it started out in the premise of the creator's rights question about that. The, the rates were very basic and mathematical. We paid a 10% cover royalty the same way basically books are. It's, it's based on the literary model. So if an underground comic started out, it's 50 cents, 5 cents that went to the artist. If it was a solo book and it was prorated as an anthology. As the price went up to a dollar and dollar fifty, whatever, then the ratio stayed the same. And every time it was reprinted, then you get an additional check. So the accounting was very simple, it was very easy to explain, it wasn't complicated at all. And the artists owned the copyright, <coughs> and they created a popular title, they owned the trademark. If I created the title, I owned it. But we tried to be egalitarian. And they got the, and the artists got their art back. Mm -hmm. That's it. Random shift from the uh, uh, factory lot. Yeah, how much um, did the comic artist look at Bugs Bunny and where they pulled my cartoon movies and all that? I mean, I saw it from uh, Free Brothers recently. You know, if there were 100 artists, there'd probably be 100 different influences. Uh, I know. Howard and I both like El Cap, for example. Probably wasn't typical. But we all grew up reading comics and the strips. You have to remember this was an era when strips and newspapers were still pretty good. And the Sunday comics and the, and the daily strips were, uh, I think, a bigger influence than you might think. Yes. It's interesting how academic disciplines and areas of studies develop and take root. Uh, one could argue that faculty set that direction and libraries respond by building collections to support that area of study. One could argue that comics has gone the reverse route in that uh, we are embracing in libraries and in publishing like Alexander Street Press these wonderful collections of comics, graphic novels, and archives on comics. And that's stimulating and promoting uh, courses and areas of study. Would you agree with that hypothesis? I, I, I would because I couldn't, I couldn't imagine my good luck when I got the only real job I ever had at the State Historical Society of Wisconsin um, because I looked at the catalog and I found underground comics and I thought, this, this can't be happening. <laughs> <laughs> so it, 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 long, long before I was there, and, and it, it, because it grew out of the same um, um, oppositional sense that Paul was talking about, that uh, Dave, was, Dave was talking about in terms of we collect the library collected labor and radical newspapers and the like, and so uh, collecting 
they were like mainstream comics, but the underground comics, uh, beginning with, uh, with uh, Joel Beck, uh, uh, Lenny and Lorena, which is 64 or 5 or something like that. Um, and um, it's how come, it's one of the ways in which I knew Dennis, but that is that uh, there was no difference I discovered. That there were other librarians there that I was joining that between what I was interested in and was reading on my own time and what we've got to collect at work. Of course, soon I decided I wasn't going to be spending my dimes for this. I was going to be spending the state's dime. It, it was to repurpose uh, uh, public funds. Oh, Governor Walker, I've already retired. <laughs> to, to acquire those kinds of materials along with underground newspapers and the subscription. It's uh, just as Dennis was going through the exchange papers and, and looking for bookstores to write to. I mean, we got, we were getting uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of alternative papers from Evo and uh, Berkeley Bard and so forth. So we had all those kinds of things. That it's, a, it's a print continuity. And yes, I think absolutely that we collected the materials with um, the totally unproven but uh, sure, sure sense of ourselves that the audience would grow later than it really has. Uh, still waiting for comics to fully arrive, but, uh, but certainly uh, all kinds of radical history uh, uh, happened because the materials were there in the library. The, the validation that you get by being in the research library. Yes. I, can I ask this? Yes, please. I think also that there's been a radical infiltration in library and art world spaces by, um, with people with interest in these materials. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, you all know Karen, sorry, but at NYU, um, Lisa Darms, who's one of the senior archivists, um, started the Riot Girl collection in 2009, I believe. Um, and she was part of the Riot Girl movement, right? And they were really interested um, in zines and all sorts of materials um, and sort of pre preserving the sort of ephemeral material. Um, it also, similarly, at the Lesbian Herstory Archives here in Brooklyn, um, they, you know, part of their mission is to train people to be archivists, and some of the people who are at the Lesbian Herstory Archives over the past, one of them is now the chief librarian at the Graduate Center at CUNY. So there's, you know, the infiltration of radical people within these spaces is really, really important um, for this work to be um, acquired and not to be um, for access. I think you used to call it burrowing from within. Mm -hmm. One more. Um, just curious why the uh, papers ended up at, uh, at Columbia instead of, for instance, the State Historical Society in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs>